You are watching the official video podcast of Trilife Church in Worcester, Massachusetts. Tim McGraw, always stay humble and kind. What? I got to stay up there? Oh, now that, that is going to be hard. That much, I can tell you. So always stay humble and kind. So let me give you a little background, especially for those of you who are guests this morning who haven't been here. First of all, we rotate the preaching around here. We have a, a pastoral team. There are four of us, myself, Pastor Jay O'Brien, who happens to lead worship as well. Pastor Bobby, of course, is our lead pastor, and Pastor Steve Gilardi. So uh, you, just, you guys just happen to get the short straw this week with me preaching. And we've been preaching um, for really most of this year on transformation. It comes out of Romans 12, where uh, we ask God to transform us by changing the way that we think. Transform us from who we were to who we want to be, or to transform us to be more Christ-like. Can I get an amen? amen? So before I go any further, I just want to say that when we say amen, who can tell me what that means? Okay, it does. But most of the time when we say amen, it means, oh yeah, I knew that. I knew that. But yeah, I'm just, just trying to get some honesty here. When we say amen, I was like, I knew that. So when I say, can I get an amen, you guys can say amen because you knew that. All right? All right. So let me see if I can get this to work. We talked about um, the, the, the last time I, I preached. Yeah, I, I, this thing doesn't like me. I don't know why. I, I really have difficulty getting it to move. So the last time I preached, we were talking about transforming weapons. The Bible says that we have weapons. Our, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty for the tearing down of strongholds. So is there something, should I like talk to it or should I you know, say a little spell over it or point it? Nah. Oh. All right, always be under the giant. So our first supernatural unconventional weapon is unity here's what it what it meant to me a family doesn't need to be perfect it just needs to be united so if we're going to be the church and the church is going to be different from the rest of the world there's the world and there's the church if we can look at it that way the difference is we're not perfect we don't you do you don't become a christian and get perfect and you're better than everybody else no you just understand that god loves you died for you on the cross and now we can be united in family because Christ died for us. Can I get an amen? amen? Okay, so that means you knew that. You get born again by becoming a new creation. When you say you believe, Jesus actually makes us new. The Bible says that the old man dies and the new man is born. You're actually a new creation. So in order to understand and leave behind some of the old stuff, you need to understand that you're absolutely brand new. God made you brand new. Can I get one more amen? amen. So listen to this. You can't change someone who doesn't see an issue with their actions. We find that to be a difficulty in the world because a lot of people don't know that they don't know. I'm fine. I mean, how you doing this morning, brother? I'm good. I'm, I'm blessed. I'm kind of crazy God. I'm good. You cannot, and God usually will not change someone who doesn't understand that he needs to be changed. So it all starts, this weapon business starts with understanding surrender. You see, in the world, we think that when we surrender, it means we're going to be taken captive. It means we give up. It means we lose. When you surrender in this venue, when you surrender to God, it's to be set free. So our surrender sets us free so God can do what he wants to do in us to transform us into the new creation that he wants us to be. Doesn't that make perfectly good sense? Okay. So I'm going to read something to you. I'm going to go right to... Matthew 5. Matthew 5, by the way, is the Sermon on the Mount. Let me just get here with my electronics. The Sermon on the Mount, that was kind of a famous one, wasn't it? Matthew chapter 5. This is going to be a little different, though, because I'm reading it out of the message transliteration. And it's a little long, so bear with me. Just, just you know, fasten your seatbelts a little bit and listen to what God is saying to you this morning. Well, let me, before I do that, let me pray. God, thank you so much for all these folks here this morning. 
Thank you so much, Lord, for the Johnsons, the whole clan, all the families here this morning. Thank you so much for that awesome dedication, for those awesome babies. Watching this family is just an unbelievable privilege. We thank you so much for that. And Lord, you know, I was praying as I was, as you know, talking to you this morning. These people don't need me or anything clever I can say or anything I can come up with. What we need and what they need is you. So I pray, Lord, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would come down now or continue working in the hearts of your people. Open their, the eyes of their understanding and let them hear and see and feel what the Holy Spirit has to say this morning. In Jesus' name, thanks. So listen to the word of the Lord. It's Matthew 5 out of the message. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. And this is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of, every, of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world. Listen to me. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you really discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you or discredit me. This is Jesus speaking. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they're uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For they, for though they don't like it, I do, and all heaven applauds, and know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. We're going to go to verse 43, which is where the love is, and that's where we're going with this, where the love is. So in, voice, in verse 43, it says, you're familiar with the old written law, love your friend, and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. Again, Jesus is talking, he says. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer. For then, you are working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives his best. The sun to warm and the rain to nourish to everyone. Regardless, the good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is grow up. You're kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. Now can I get an amen? amen. Don't, that one doesn't mean you knew that. Because you didn't know that. That little passage, when you get a chance, you get an opportunity, you can read it in the NIV, you can read it in the NLT, you can read it in the ESV, you can read it in the King James. You can read it in the NASB. You can read it in any particular translation that you want. But it says the same thing, that God wants to transform the church, the people that he calls his own, which is you and I. 
He wants us to be different. He wants us to love one another as we love him. Does that sound right? Sounds right to me. So let's go the other way. Transforming weapon number four is love. Now, in Deuteronomy 6.5, like it says right there, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. In the Jews called that the Shema. That was the first, the number one commandment for them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Same for us. We want to love God. The deal is, though, we can love God that way because he first loved us. We couldn't do that without God loving us first. It would be impossible. You see, the idea is that Jesus came, died on the cross, was resurrected, sent his spirit, and his spirit now works in us this kind of love. Without that, it doesn't happen. Love your enemies. How many of you are really good at that? I mean, if you, we just heard it, love those, if you just only love those are, that love you, what do you expect, a bonus? But how about loving your enemies? Is that something, I want you to raise your hand if you're really good at that. Yeah. So chances are we need the Holy Spirit. Bless those who persecute you or spitefully use you. How many of you are really good at that? No, not so much. So if we're going to be transformed, though, if we're going to be what God created us to be, the new creation, by the power of the Holy Spirit, there's actually a weapon in this kind of love that transforms our enemies into friends, that transforms our enemies into someone that, we're not, that we don't have to be afraid of anymore. There's a transforming power in this kind of love. Make sense? I think it does. Forgiveness. This one is a rather big one. I think that forgiveness is hard to understand sometimes. We first have to understand that we've been forgiven. I think it's imperative to understand that we've been forgiven. I can tell you that I personally struggled with being forgiven because, you see, I was not a nice guy. I was not a nice person. The person that stands here now, all American, everybody loves P Pastor Dave, you know, nice guy, wouldn't say a bad word about That's a lie. That's a lie. I am a lousy person who God transformed into the image of his son, and I didn't have anything to do with it. Do you understand me? I had to understand forgiveness, though. I had to get the fact that God could forgive me. i got to be honest with you and tell you, I, I did an altar call when I got saved. My, my wife and I, we got on our knees on, in front of the TV. Uh, a televangelist was saying the sinner's prayer, and I was so broken and so humbled. I thought, well, I'll try that. Nothing else has worked. Let me roll onto my knees and see what God will do. And we kept going to, to altar calls, and we kept going to church for several years. I went to 15 altar calls because I didn't want to believe that I, didn't, I couldn't fathom that God would actually forgive me for everything that I had done. We have to understand that God forgives us, that God forgives us, that he hung on the cross for our forgiveness, all of us. We are forgiven. That's the deal. He said to the adulterer, the adulteress, excuse me, your sins are forgiven. Before that, in the Old Testament, he forgives all my sins, all my sins. There's a big word we use. It's called propitiation. God has forgiven the sins you didn't even commit yet. He forgave all the sins of the past, all the sins today, and even the sins you didn't do yet. Anyone planning on sinning when they leave here? No, but it happens anyway. God forgives those sins. Amen? Matthew 6, 14, same Sermon on the Mount. Your Heavenly Father will forgive you if you forgive those who sin against you, but if you refuse to forgive them, he will not forgive you. Here's a weapon. This is a weapon. What would be the opposite of forgiveness? Unforgiveness, right? <sighs> you know, I, I, I've been around a long time. I, I've been saved a long time. And God is breaking me just recently. I am surrendering to, be, to being humbled and broken. Because I realize that I'm not really that good at loving. I, I'm not really that good at forgiving. I mean, I can say I forgive people. I, I can say you're forgiven. I can say that. I'm pretty good at saying stuff. 
But in my heart, I, I've asked God, myself, personally, to humble me and give me a heart that really forgives, just like I know that I've been forgiven. You see, there isn't a sin that you guys could think of that I wasn't involved in. I, I, trust me, I, I was. Whatever you can think of, I did that. I tried that. I've been there. I've, I've done that. And yet I know that God has forgiven me. So don't judge someone else's sin because it's different than yours. You have to be forgiving. It's a weapon to forgive people. Do you understand me? It's a weapon to forgive yourself, and it's a weapon to be forgiving of other people. And some of you sitting here this morning are holding on to unforgiveness. You're, you're holding on to it. Now, maybe you don't even know. I had to go to God to ask him, God, show me. If there's anything I'm holding on to, will you please let me know what it is? Because I don't, I don't want to hold any more unforgiveness. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there. Let me read a, a couple of quick stories to you. Anybody ever heard of Corey Ten Boom? Yeah, Corey had a good forgiveness thing. Let me find it here. Uh, everybody all right? We turned up the heat a little bit. So I was going to be slick and have all this memorized, but I, I am slick. I just didn't memorize it. Okay. So Corey Ten Boom told of not being able to forget a wrong that had been done to her. She had forgiven the person, but she kept rehashing the innocent, and so she couldn't the, the incident, and she couldn't sleep. Finally, Corey cried out to God for help in putting the problem to rest, and his help came in the form of a kindly Lutheran pastor. Corey wrote, to whom I, I, she, she confessed her failure to this pastor after two sleepless weeks. Up in the church tower, the pastor said, nodding out the window, is a bell which is rung by pulling a rope. But you know what? After the sexton lets go of the rope, the bell keeps on swinging. Ding, dong, ding, dong. Slower and slower until it finally, there's no more dings or dongs and it stops. I believe the same thing is true of forgiveness. When we forgive, we take our hand off the rope. But if we've been tugging at our grievances for a long time, or holding on to this for a long time, we mustn't be surprised if the old angry thoughts keep coming for a while. They're just the ding-dongs of the old bell slowing down. And so it proved to be. There were a few more midnight reverberations, a couple of dings when the subject came up in my conversations, but the force which was my willingness in the matter, had gone out of them. They came less and less often, and at last stopped altogether. We can trust God not only above our emotions, but above our thoughts. Corey Ten Boom was, could have been holding on to some unforgiveness. She had some hard stuff happen to her unjustifiably so. So here's the deal. Listen to me. We sometimes get the idea of forgiveness as exoneration. I can't forgive that person because they don't deserve it. I can't forgive them because that would be as if they deserved it or exoneration. That's not what forgiveness is. The person still has to deal with whatever it is that they did. But when you forgive, you release yourself. If you d I'm going to forgive that. If you don't forgive, then you give the opportunity for bitterness and resentment to grow in you. And suddenly, bitterness and resentment come out in ways and attitudes and actions that you weren't prepared for, that you might not even be aware of. You can have unforgiveness turn to resent resentment and bitterness and have it come out in ways you didn't even realize. Do you get what I'm saying? So the Holy Spirit, when we ask him, and this is what I'm asking everyone to do. This is what I'm asking you to do. This is what I am doing. I'm asking God to show me. I'm asking God to help me. 
forgive. I'm asking God to help me be a better forgiving person, to transform me. I want to use it as a weapon for myself first. I want the weapon to be used on me first. And if I can change, if I can be better at forgiving, then maybe I can help somebody else be better at forgiving. Or maybe I can forgive someone that doesn't deserve being forgiven. Can I get one more amen? amen. Okay. There's one other story. Anybody ever hear of George Harrison? Former Beatle, George Harrison, died in December 2001. During his final days, his wife and child and his sister Louise were at his bedside. It was Louise's presence that was especially poignant. You see, she and George had been feuding with each other for 40 years because she had named a bed and breakfast 40 years before a hard day's night. It's been a hard day's night, and I've been sleeping like a lot. No, you guys don't remember. So he's mad at his sister for 40 years. They didn't talk over a bed and breakfast. What would he care about that? It seems kind of trivial. But when you're mad at your sister, has anybody got a sister they ever been mad at or a brother or a relative? Anybody got relatives they're estranged from? Am I talking to anybody in this joint? Yeah, jeez. So he knows he's dying. He's on his deathbed. His sister said that when they were younger, they used to hold hands and they talked about God and life. And they loved each other tremendously. So now at the end of his life, they, she gets to hold, hand with, hold hands with him again. They still talk about God. They still talk about life. And she said that at the end of the reconciliation, she could look again with love into his eyes. So, if we are truly to be Christ-like and forgiving, Whoever it is that we reconcile with, we ought to be able to look at them with love in our eyes. Now, I have been in this church for 30 years or somewhere around there, when it, or something like that. I have seen a lot of this happen. I've seen people sitting over there who don't talk to people sitting over here. I've seen people sitting back there who've got an edge on somebody sitting down here. I've been in on the reconciliations when we said, yes, I forgive you, bro. Yeah, I forgive you, bro. And yet we still sit on opposite corners and we don't look at each other with love in our eyes. I'm just trying to be real. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So this is the Holy Spirit's work. This isn't something we're going to conjure up. Remember when you were a kid and you did something and they made you apologize? Go apologize to Tommy. Go say you're sorry. I was like every day for me. I'm sorry. You think we meant, did you mean it? Of course you didn't mean it. Well, that's, but when God comes in and he does this, it's supernatural. It's a weapon. This kind of forgiveness and reconciliation only God can do. It's a weapon. So before you, or as you hit the pillow tonight, ask God. Ask him. You know what the story is. You, you know what it is. So, the last transformational weapon is to believe. And I discovered that everything rests on this. The gospel says, those, in Mark, says, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. But those who refuse to believe will be condemned. That's a little hard. Pretty much you either believe or you don't, isn't it? Wow, that's hard. So, in John, this gospel says, I, I say emphatically, verily, verily, I say that anyone who listens to my message and believes in God who sent me, this is Jesus talking, has eternal life and will never be damned for his sins, but has already passed out of death into life. That's pretty encouraging. That's pretty encouraging. John, the gospel, and then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me, but blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. So this was Thomas. Everybody, anybody remember doubting Thomas? They said, Jesus is alive. They said, no. Thomas said, no way. No, 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 no. I watched him die. He can't be. I won't believe unless I can stick my fingers in his side. So Jesus shows up. This is what Jesus said to him. You believe because you've seen me. Anybody here seen Jesus? 
Well, we, we <laughs> praise the Lord, sister. <laughs> praise the Lord. I know. I can see Jesus in your eyes, too. So my point is you have to believe, only believe. This deal is about believing. It's about believing. And I would venture to say that none of the other stuff happens without believing. Do we have a clip. Do we have some kind of clip back there, a video, uh, Caleb? We can play that. I'm going to put a plug in for a movie. It's old. This movie's old. It's gone by already. You can still get it, though. It's called Do You Believe? Do You Believe? Watch this. Do you believe in the cross of Christ? I'm a pastor. If you believe, then the question is, what are you going to do about it? What does it mean to believe? It is forgiveness. It is redemption. It is unconditional love. Where was God the night we lost Kathleen? Just because we're on the street it doesn't mean that I'm a bad mother. From the looks of things, she couldn't care less whether we save her or not. We can't just turn her away. I'm not asking you to. It's a miracle. There's no such thing as miracles. I save these people. I should get the credit. I won't apologize for sharing the gospel with a dying man. This cross is going to cost you. You're about to throw everything away. I don't have a choice. This is all one moment. Everything changes for us. Stop! Please! I've been where you're going. You have to choose. It'll take the first step. It'll change your life. I was once asked if you were ever accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? So you believe in Jesus? I do. There's a whole world of people out there who need help. Take out your cross and let it be a reminder of the amazing gift that Christ has given us. And let it inspire us to live our lives the way Jesus lived his. See, Mommy? God really does love us. He does, baby. That mother and daughter right there were homeless in this movie. They were homeless. 12 situations, 12 stories of different families, different people. The key line in there was, if you were accused of being a, a Christian, would there be ever enough evidence enough to convict you? <laughs> oh, well. You see, the church is supposed to look different and act different than the rest of the world, than everybody else. And I am not standing here as the greatest example. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is, do you believe? Because if you believe, then God can change you. Because, you see, God can fix anything. God can do anything. We went through a teaching a while back. It's called the Truth Project. The key line was, do you really believe that what you believe is really real? Because I think that there are tests every day there are situations that come into our lives there are interactions that we have with each other have you ever has it ever been said about you and you call yourself a Christian anybody ever say that to you and you call yourself a Christian and where was God when my brother-in-law died? And where was God when my job was lost? And where was God? And you put whatever you want to put in there. The question is, do you believe? We're going to have communion. Ushers, you can get the, the communion ready. See, Jesus said that believing was like, I, I think, one of the most important things.
This is what we've always said as the sinner's prayer in the New Living Translation. It says, Or if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your own heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Now, I, I've said that over the years with a few people, and I've always asked the question when we did a little, somebody got saved. I always like to ask, well, what did you get saved from? Because isn't that a valid question? <laughs> so you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from sin. Saved from separation with God. Saved from acting like everybody else does sooner or later. Saved from a life without understanding the transforming, transforming excuse me, power of God. So when you believe and you're saved, that's the beginning of the transformation. So all we're trying to do as the church, little by little, slowly but surely, as we prod and plug along on a daily basis, is become more and more like Jesus. That's all we're trying to do. And along the way, if we believe that God is real, if we believe what God said, if we believe that God died on the cross, if we believe that the Holy Spirit is real and working in us, then we can love better, and we can forgive better, and we can have unity, and we can understand that we were created brand new, that we don't have to live like we did anymore, that there is deliverance from our sins, there's deliverance from our habits, from the things that we do that we don't want to do, from the things we've been stuck in. Anybody stuck in anything here? God wants to heal you of that. He wants to deliver you of that. This is at the place where we could give God praise. We could praise God right now. Let's give him a little praise. Praise. So, ushers, come, come on down and begin passing out those elements. And, you know, as we take communion, it, it's one of those things that we do in remembrance of what Jesus did. We want, you know, the Bible says, do the, it said, do this in remembrance of me. You know, Jesus hung on the cross. You can just begin passing them right Jesus hung on the cross, and he died. And that wasn't the end of it, you see. After the third day, what happened? He rose. And then what happened? About 40 days later, as the disciples were being obedient, he sent the Holy Spirit. That's the same Holy Spirit that's in here this morning. That's the same Holy Spirit that we want to grab a hold of, that we want to latch on to, that we want to partner with, because that's where the transformation is. That's where the weapons are. Is there anyone here? Let me ask this question. Stupid. It's a stupid question. Is there anyone here who would not like to know or learn or be shown how to love more effectively? Is there anyone here who would not like to know or, or be transformed into being a better forgiver? Is there anyone here, and here's the key question, this is in the Gospels where it says, listen to this, it said, Lord, we believe, but help us in our unbelief. Is there anyone here who wouldn't like some help in the place where they don't believe? Because we all have doubts. In that movie, there was a gangster holding a gun at the pastor, and he said, do you believe in Jesus? Sooner or later, they're going to be wanting to put a chip in you and asking if you believe. And if you believe, then we'll put this chip, if, excuse me, if you don't believe, we'll put this chip in you. If you do, if you do believe, <laughs> I believe the 1045 is on, or 1145 is on time. It's going to come that time. And these questions are arbitrary. It doesn't matter. Do you believe? And if you get to that place where it's going to cost you, are you going to be able to pay that price? Don't answer it because the answer is no. It's not a trick question. I'm not trying to set you up to feel bad. The Holy Spirit has to be with you at that moment. The Holy Spirit will have to be there. That's what you need to believe in. You need to believe that God is greater than your fear. You need
need to believe that God is greater than your circumstance. You need to believe that God is greater than the trouble you're in. You need to believe that God is greater than your family worries and woes. You need to believe that God is greater than your finances. He's greater than your situation. That's what we need to believe. That's what we need to believe. Just one minute when everybody gets served. You know, the, the idea of communion, as I said, is a remembrance. And we take the bread. Everybody take the bread in your hand. Jesus said at the Last Supper, when he blessed the bread, he said, this is my body that's broken for you. He was looking down through the annals of time to us here this morning. So it's just as if he was talking to you. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. The person sitting in your seat. This is my body broken for you. I hung on the cross for you. So let's do this as we eat in remembrance that Jesus' body was broken in place of ours. That Jesus hung on the cross and took our sin. Go ahead and eat that. And then he took the cup. He took the cup that was set aside for the Messiah because he was the Messiah. And he lifted it up and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. The everlasting covenant, the one that will never end. The covenant that he's made, that he was speaking again down through the annals of time to you this morning. The covenant in blood. In the blood of the Lamb of God slain on the cross for you. Go figure. Go figure. Only God would do that for me. I don't know anybody else that would have done it for me. You know anybody who would have done that for you? Well, that's what he did. Go ahead and drink that cup. So I'm done. We're just going to pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your spirit here this morning. I thank you so much for the patience of these people. We pray, Lord, that you would supernaturally Bring to our minds and hearts and spirits the thing that was most important to us that was said this morning, the thing that struck us in our hearts, in, our, in the place where only we know. I pray, Lord, that as we hit the pillow tonight, you'd bring that thing, that thought to remembrance, that you'd help us to take it captive, and that you would transform us by the renewing of our minds. You would help to change the way we think. Thank you, Lord. We love you for that. We give you all the praise and all the glory. So now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face and his countenance toward you and give you peace today, the rest of the day, and forever. In Jesus' name. And all the people said, I knew that. I knew that. Amen. So be it. Thank you for watching the official video podcast of Trilife Church in Worcester, Massachusetts. For more information, please visit trilifechurch.com.